And uh, Robert, it's all yours. Thank you. Can you all hear me all right? Good. Good morning. Thank you. Um, my name is Bob Bauman. Uh, I am going to talk today about a little bit different perspective on security, more how to integrate physical security. Everybody talks about cybersecurity these days, but uh, there's more to the story. And so we're going to spend today talking about uh, the physical security aspects to it, but also how you can, in a practical sense, be able to look at uh, particularly the world of CIPRNET and getting accredited, getting your C CCRIs approved. That's always been a challenge, and now it's getting more and more. And uh, DISA has become more uh, scrutinizing and uh, more exacting in terms of patch management and in terms of ATO's ability to operate. And so as that happens, there needs to be a practical uh, look at, um, at how you can, uh, can achieve not only getting a practical sense of being able to operate and function, being able to get on and off Cipernet quickly and easily, but also to provide the convenience and the compliance in order to allow you to, to operate. Now, um, I have been uh, involved in physical security for about 30 years. I guess I got more gray hair than anybody in this room, so I've been... Uh, been a dinosaur in, in this business for a long time. So the real issue has been as the IT world expands and grows, you know, how does physical security get built into that plan? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, the aspect and what we're going to do is try to analyze the different versions of security and how they all play together. Cybersecurity has always been working from the inside out. And it's also uh, trying to look at how you uh, envision what the threat is going to be. And we need to have something in a more proactive sense. But because this has been the case, that physical security has been lim limited and it's limited because all the policies and everything associated with it are always facility-based. So they stop at a wall or they stop at a door or they are uh, looking at protecting a particular enclave, like with a container. But the problem is, because they stop at the wall, they're not looking at the network itself. And because of that, the network equipment that's inside is left vulnerable. And this makes for uh, the fact that since there is no policy covering from the wall to the desktop, that our focus today is going to be purely on the endpoint. And so we're not talking about the cloud or where servers may reside. <laughs> Over history, they've just seemed to change the names of where the servers are. And uh, uh, when you look at how technology expands, the, the bits and pieces kind of stay the same. They just rearrange the order and how you get to them. And, of course, it has to do with speed and performance and bandwidth and all the other issues. But because there is no policy to the desktop, it's left a vulnerability, particularly against the insider threat. And I give you Bradley, now Chelsea Manning, and Ed, Edward Snowden. Why did they succeed? Or why did they uh, create a threat? They created the threat because they were in a perfectly cleared skiff, in a perfectly cleared cave in Hawaii, and they were perfectly cleared personnel. But the problem was, they got away with the farm because the skiff that was supposed to be there to protect the network didn't. 
It only protects space. It doesn't protect network equipment. And that's going to be the focus of our, our attention today. So when we look at the insider threat and we look at risk, risk is a combination of a couple things. First of all, it's a matter of like, likelihood. And the likelihood, of course, in the case of an insider threat is exploding because the networks are exploding. Cipronet is expanding all over the place. And, uh, uh, and so the need for protecting every access point becomes much more important because the other side of that equation is the consequence. And that is that as each access point increases and you get more of them, each one becomes a threat vector. And therefore, just like with any terrorist, it only takes one to get through. And so now as you expand the threat vectors, you now expand the exposure. And with the network growing, you have a much larger database to deal with. You have more volume of data that's exposed. And every single endpoint has access to the entire network. And that's what creates this exponential increase in the in insider threat. And we're going to look at how to layer physical security into that to make it work. Because part of the problem with cyber is its intelligence of the network that can be used against itself. And this becomes the real difficulty. But with physical security, we can make it more ro robust. Up till now, DISA has been responding with added scrutiny to the network that I mentioned earlier, with tighter C CCRIs and with these things called DISA stigs that, uh, that have mandated how you, uh, you can fill out a SIPR node and, and what you're allowed to do and not to do. But with those tighter C CCRIs, the important thing is there has to be a practical uh, Countermeasure. there has to be a practical implementation. Well, how do you do that? And you can't do it with buildings and rooms and people. You need to have something else. Now, the going back and seeing the IT world as it's evolved, uh, there's been quite a dichotomy between physical security and what's been IT security, InfoSec. I mean, the names have changed, but the threat and the, the level of security requirement stays the same. But in just looking at the cultures that you're dealing with, uh, there is, of course, the C4I world that we all live in, but I have defined one I call G3D, and that's the physical security domain of facilities, and that basically stands for guns, gates, guards, and dogs. And so you have a world of difference here between how things are looked at. One is dynamic, one is static. Physical security is there, it's supposed to be there forever, but technology is moving pretty much at the speed of light, whereas when you're facility-based, things don't change. And so the culture and the mentality of people that look at it, they're looking at things totally differently because one is in a virtual world, one is in a tangible, physical, touchy-feely world. And also, one is virtually online all the time, and the physical security guys, they want everything offline. So what they want is, basically the IT world wants users to be able to have access to everything all the time, and the physical security side doesn't want anybody to have access to anything ever. So you end up with this cultural divide. And that's one of the things we have to deal with here. Now, uh, one of the things that we're looking at is there needs to be convergence. We have to integrate in the physical security with the other, I'll call them the other sex, which are physical... That one. There we go. Which is, um, you have FISEC, you have OPSEC, you have COMSEC. And then on the IT side, you have InfoSec, you have MSEC for emanation security, Tempest, and that kind of thing. And then I just coined the term CyberSec 
to fill in the gap there. But what we're looking at is a new concept that doesn't focus on any of these specific security elements, but it focuses on the endpoint, which I refer to as a new phrase I'm coining called NSEC. And that's because it needs to combine all these, these elements together to be effective. And that's what, what we've been talking about. Now, the security in depth, you're looking at multiple threats now. It's not just the insider threat, because that can be done through either kinetic attacks or a denial of service attack, which could be a combination of a physical threat and a cyber threat. And you're seeing this a lot now in the power grid, where in, in Ukraine there was a specific Russian attack back in 2015 that targeted their grid. And it was a combination physical cyber attack. There have been other attacks. But those kinds of things in combination are the threats that we also have to consider. Of course, you have the threat theft data man manipulation. You've got the em emanation side of things in terms of Tempest uh, security and trying to protect the MIRFI signal propagation. And then you have, of course, the cyber. And that looks at either whether it's an insider or an outsider. And then the last one is the one that's the most difficult. And that's the one where you're dealing with human error or a natural disaster or something that you can't predict. It's not an overt nefarious threat. It could be accidental. Or it could be a natural disaster that you have to deal with, like a power outage or something of that sort. And so you have to look at all these together as to how you come up with a holistic sol solution that can make this work. And of course, this is all in a constant state of flux because technology is advancing, as I said before, at the speed of light. Security is still there in the glacier. And that our adversaries are coming at us uh, all the time in different means, different methods. They're as uh, smart at coming at us as we're trying to defend ourselves and in some cases go after them. So in looking at cyber and physical security together and how we can blend the two, you have to look at cyber security, of course, where it's through the network, physical security is around it. You also have to look at, and this is a very important point, cyber security is reactive. It's waiting for something to happen. It's what I've coined the phrase cyber chess. And we're usually three, four, five moves behind our, our adversaries. We may be playing a different game, but the problem is that we're always anticipating something happening. And although there's a tremendous amount of work being done on anal analytics, behavioral analytics, uh, network uh, bandwidth ac activity, thing, things of that sort, uh, persistent threat, threat analysis, things of that sort. But the real issue is it's still reactive. And if you layer in physical security, then you have the option of being proactive as well. And they need to work together in concert to give you effective endpoint sec security. Now, mention pe people. Rarely can you use the word always or never. This is one of the cases. Security is always a people problem in one form or another because you're dealing with guards, you're dealing with users, you're dealing with uh, network techs, you're dealing with administrators, you're dealing with a uh, whole host of people that are involved in both the protection of the network, the operation of the network, and... Uh, and all aspects of how you end up uh, working with the network in and around it. The other thing is that because of that, because every user now is a potential threat vector, that the endpoint becomes the greatest vulnerability. And as that is the case, 
what we're going to look at is not just physical security itself, but how you effectively look at access control to the network and to the network equipment. Now, I'm an old guy, so I got a lot of history behind me. So I'm going to give you a little history here just to bring everybody up to where, where these threats have evolved from. And uh, the, the inflection point that hit us was right around 1990. And what happened then is there was a strategic shift between batch processing of data in one centralized location and communications and how a distributed network is created. In my earlier career, when I first got involved in this in distributed computing, I was a VAR for Sun Microsystems. In fact, I was their VAR number four back in 1986. And their advertising campaign is the network is the computer. And I guess you could also say the computer is the network. But it was now the standpoint of it wasn't just processing data, it was access to it. And it was a distributed networking environment that changed the whole paradigm. So what happened was, of course, it got accelerated by the use of the Internet. There had been a thing called ARPANET before that in the 80s, but when the World Wide Web came out and it became the Internet, it exploded, both for the good guys and the bad guys. And this has been a major shift, but... And this is probably one of the most important points here. The function of a SCIF or a cleared area, closed access area, open secret storage area, define it as, as you will, TSSCI, whatever the level. The whole point of a SCIF got changed. It wasn't just a secured enclave where people came in and they got classified information, they talked classified conferences, and then they left. No, it became a network portal. All of them did. And it wasn't just a portal to another SCIF, it was a portal to every SCIF or every secured location or every endpoint, wherever it happened to be. And so now you have a real problem with how you define the physical security of that environment. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So with the distributed networking pushing security now more to the endpoint, it's like pouring water on grem gremlins. You know, it just they keep multiplying and all of a sudden how to control that becomes particularly for physical security people where they used to be just well just build a room. Well you know, who's got a half a million dollars to, to build out a room here and there and there, you end up obsoleting yourself because with bracking and with all the moving and changing and the mobility of the network environment we're in, uh, it is very difficult to physically secure that environment. And, of course, as the endpoints grow, the vulnerability grows, and the problem is the policy has been static, particularly in the physical security area. It has not kept pace with either technology or the threats that, that we face. And the funny thing is the, desk point, the desktop itself hasn't changed much. It's still a keyboard, monitor, mouse. Okay, you may have a flat panel display now instead of an old cathode ray tube. And you may have VTC terminals and voice over IP phones. So your method of communicating may change. But the desktop is still there. Uh, there was a guy named Hall in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, back in 1887, who invented the QWERTY keyboard. And what do we type on today? <laughs> the same QWERTY keyboard, okay? So the user interface hasn't changed at all. And the human interface or the man-machine interface hasn't changed. What's changed is the volume of data the speed with which you can access a network, and the number of people and the real-time nature that is now required, particularly in classified networks that get event-driven, where you have to respond to a missile going off in North Korea or something going on in Iran with a ship in the Gulf. So 
it's now a real-time environment that has changed the paradigm of what we have to deal with. As I mentioned, VTC terminals and go on. So when we look at the endpoint, we need to define a set of objectives of what we want to have for a secured enclave that's now distributed, not in a centralized facility. First of all, the paradigm there is to secure the network equipment, not the space. Edward Snowden got away with everything because he was in a perfectly cleared skiff and a perfectly cleared guy. But once he got inside the skiff, the world was his oyster because everything was available to him. All the network equipment was out and exposed. And that's not the kind of protection we need because of the fact that the skiff is now a network portal. You also have to emphasize, because of the real-time requirement you have to emphasize being online instead of reverting, as the physical security folks do, to offline storage in a GSA container or wherever, removing hard drives, removing lap- laptops. That creates a whole host of problems, and we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. You also want to have the objective of tying the network, or tying the security to the network instead of to the facility. And this becomes very important if you're going to have any kind of a seamless security solution from the desktop to the cloud instead of from the wall or a Dropbox or a room to a cloud. And that is what, what we need to look at. The whole idea is to bring the network to you, which is now the requirement, instead of you having to go to the network. Now... In the traditional sense, you've had skiffs before, which only secure space. You connect skiffs together with what they call PDS, which is a protective distribution system. And that just is the conveyance, the conduit to go, the spaghetti that goes through, throughout a building. But now you have red data being spread throughout a facility. It's fixed, it's permanent, it's locked in, it can't be changed, it can't be upgraded. And the one thing we know about technology is it's always changing. The architectures are always changing. You can be going from thick clients to thin clients to zero clients to all kinds of other architectural changes, adding in VTC terminals, things of that sort. Always are shifting. Number of users, where they're located. This is a huge issue. And you can't rely on a fixed permanent octopus kind of a network that you can't adapt or change or upgrade. The idea of a GSA storage container being used for offline storage of hard drives is fine for the security of the hard drive, but just pulling it in and out of a network, how many times you get in insertion problems with hard drives, pulling laptops out, and as you see, this becomes a huge barrier when DISA comes up and says, hey, you have to reboot, I mean, you have to have your antiviral updates done now within hours, not days. And so how do you react to that? And the end point then, from a, certainly a physical point of view, has been virtually ignored. This is where we need to be shifting, and this is why this talk is going to be is focused specifically on the end point itself. Here's the Gava spaghetti that we're looking at here. Uh, you can see it can be a combination of drop boxes and terminal devices and hard drives that are put into safes and laptops that are on or off. And then you're plugging and unplugging cabling into these drop boxes and all this together. And every site is different. Every site has its own configuration, its own system requirements, its own user interface. So you have to be extremely flexible to adapt to all these. And so here's what the CIPRNET requirements are evolving into that are in conflict with what that traditional physical security infrastructure has been. First of all, there are DISA stigs out there right now, and we're going to review those in detail in, in a minute, that have tightened up 
the user access to network equipment and tightened up the updating of antiviral patches. DISA will bounce you off of the network if you're not updated within like 48 hours, I think the time is now. Used to be you could go a couple of weeks, but they're not waiting for you to have to get online and boot. So this online offline paradigm is, is a real problem. There's another thing associated with that too I should mention. And that is electronic hardware, computer hardware, is infinitely more reliable when it's left online and running all the time. In fact, the reliability factors are almost five to one difference. Where with a PC or with a hard drive, you can end up replacing it once a year if you're powering it up and powering it down every day because that power spikes. Uh, that's what hits its four to five times the amps on power up every time. You have a light bulb. When does the light go out? When you flick the switch on. That's because of that spike. So the same thing with electronics. You do that over time, it, it has a dramatic effect on the hardware re reliability. But also, what you want to do is they're reducing the dependence on PDS. They're wanting to push encryption to the endpoint. This is for a couple of reasons. Uh, bandwidth and performance is one. Because if they can push encryption out to each end endpoint where they all have a gig gigabit transfer speeds or higher speed encryption, you don't have bottlenecks that are in what they like to call comm closets where everything goes through one in encryption device. If that fails, the whole enterprise fails. Rather than now, they can, they can di distribute that. The second factor, not f as well as reliability, is the fact that the speed of the access goes way down. And I've heard a lot of complaints from SIPR users are saying, well, if everything's going through a comm closet and they're all going through the same pipe at that point, then the more people that are on the network, it's a party line, it's the, the less the bandwidth goes down. And, um, and I think that the real issue is one of, uh, uh, of having to, if you spread this out as far as you can, as close to the desktop as you can get, you increase both reliability and performance. Did you have a question? I have a comment. The other yeah. factor Modern uh, tackling software, is, as an example, not to get too very specific, but they can actually push a lot more over the air rekeying of that equipment. Whereas before, there was a requirement for a physical individual to come by mm -hmm. with a data transfer device or an XKL and load each piece of equipment. Now, that, that concept on the cryptographic devices can be centrally managed, which means that they can push put one in every office and it doesn't require much more intensive manpower. Excellent point. Excellent point. OTAR has kind of changed the whole world of, of encryption management. And a lot of it is to make it simpler, to make it more effective. Because even though, and I think this is one of the, one of the challenges, and you have people that are for or, or against uh, commercial sol solutions for, for classified and CSFC. And part of the problem with that is Type 1 encryption is all managed by NSA, and their ability to effectively manage it and get it to every endpoint is very, very critical. C uh, CSFC is managed by each of the MAGCOMs or the, the activity, and the management of it becomes the real problem. So that is a tail that does wag the dog. Thank you for bringing that up. Now, whoops, here we go again. There we go. Um, the other conflict is that DISA has come up with some requirements that's getting in everybody's hair these days to try to getting their C CCRIs approved. And that is that they do not want users to have access to network equipment, only to the network. And because of the growing need to have access to SIPR, this becomes a major problem. And as I said before, you're looking at hours to get patches updated, not days. I was just out in uh, giving this talk out at uh, Ram Ramstein. 
And a guy came up and he said, it's not Sipper Tuesday anymore. It's Sipper Tuesday and Sipper Thursday. And it just keeps going on and on and on. So, um, so I think that this is an increasing thing because DISA has to keep control of the network as it's exploding on them as well. And the endpoint becomes a critical juncture for that. Here's what the current policy is out there. They're stovepiped. Okay, I heard a funny line out at Ramstein too, a colonel out there, the, the A6 says, you know, you can have stovepipes or silos. And he said, well, I like to think of them as columns of excellence. <laughs> and I said, I gotta remember that one. <laughs> but uh, in this case, it's not, because the policies that are out there are very disjointed. They don't offer uh, there's no continuity between them. You've got a SCIF spec, ICD-705. You've got a PDS spec, 7003. And you've got an IPS or physical security container spec, which is uh, uh, 2786. And they don't talk to each other. The language isn't the same. There's no continuity. So therefore, there can't be anything seamless between them. They're all separate. And so all the people that define the policy which is usually looking, you know, it's going 100 miles an hour down the freeway and the only thing you're allowed to look at is the rear view mirror because that's all they look at is what's happened in the past. They don't look forward. And so what has happened because of this stove piping is that the local AOs, accrediting officer, accrediting authorities, have been uh, forced to make their own decisions and they don't have a lot of policy and a lot of guidance. So you end up getting a open in interpretation. So it's kind of everybody looking at what they think is the right thing to do. Now, one of the, uh, the company, because we're in the physical security business, uh, that we secure this, these, these endpoints, uh, our, our objective, and one thing I'll just interject here, is what is your major mission? What is your, your objective? And the real objective should be, does your security officer sleep well at night? Because that's the measure of success. Because the local authority knows best for each of the sites that he's responsible for as to what level of security should be there, regardless of what the policy says. And that is the, the tail that's always been wagging the dog. And something that I know you who are in the, the security business know this hand in hand, but you're also accountable for it, which makes it even worse. So you aren't given the tools, but you don't have the policy to back you up most of the time, and it's limited re resources. So what we try to do is look at how can you come up with practical imp implementations that can physically secure that endpoint that'll make this work for you. Now, the DISA STIG itself, I just wanted to review it real quickly, is, um, has two checks to it. One is this thing, which we'll talk about in a minute, called an IPS security container, Information Processing System Security Container. It's a mouthful. Uh, only GSA could come up with a name like that. Uh, that. That is now qualified as a standalone CAA, closed access area. So it can be put anywhere. And so with that, you now have a second check, which is the one that has everybody up in, uh, you know, up in arms here. And that is that only network administrators are to have access to network equipment, i.e. users are not. So how do you come up with a solution where you're pulling hard drives in and out of safes or laptops in and out of safes or you're plugging into drop boxes every day, how do you secure and comply with this, this spec? And this STIG is what drives the CCRI criteria that's enforced today. So that's what we are gonna talk about. The only other reference is in the PDS spec. And it says that terminal equipment must be safeguarded against tampering, or it has to be tamper evident. Now we got a new term, what the heck does that mean, right? 
And so now you have to say, okay, well, how do you define that? And how do you have a criteria and a test spec and, and something that can identify what's important and, and what we should be have in order to be compliant and this is just a, a catchphrase that's kind of thrown out there just to cover, cover the spec, but it doesn't really solve the problem. So when we look at a solution, several things become important here. One is you want to keep it simple. You want it convenient, you want it simple, but it has to be functional. Otherwise, people aren't going to use it. They're going to do work, workarounds all the time. It needs to be flexible. Why? Because every configuration, every endpoint is different to one degree or another. They're not all the same. Also, there needs to be some degree of modularity because these networks are in a constant state of flux. They're moving, changing, growing, expanding, con contracting all at the same time. So there has to be some modularity there that allows a self-contained transportability as the network changes. In other words, you're tying your, you know, uh, you're tying the network equipment or the security to the network, not to the facility. And that has to be an important point here. I went over the hardware re reliability issues. You need to have built-in reliability. Being online all the time enhances that greatly. And the other point is it needs to be real time. You have to have access to the network where and when you need it. And that becomes critically important. And the last thing is, of course, it has to be, be affordable. If you're building rooms and building uh, closed access areas or skiffs or whatever you have, every time you build it, it's now a fixed permanent piece. It does not allow you to have any degree of transportability. And that becomes a real problem from a cost because next time you move, you've got to build yourself another skiff. Now, this is what, what we do as a company, but this is the solution that we are looking at expanding on that helps to solve and, and meet these, these objectives. It's called an IPS security container. And it basically is an armored computer cabinet. So it went from being offline storage to being online op operation. And all it does is take basically a safe, and it adds cooling, rack mounting, and a secure way of getting power and data cables in and out in an effective way. And that's how this this product has evolved, and it's been evolving over 30 years. But it's one of those, you know, it took 30 years to be an overnight success kind of thing. It was really, in a sense, ahead of the market and the policies in terms of how the markets and networks were expanding. And this is a solution that now is meeting that, uh, that challenge. Uh, one of the quotes I always use it, for you hockey fans in here is, uh, from Wayne Gretzky, who was asked uh, in a Sports Illustrated interview, well, why are you the great one? What made you better than anybody else? And he had one answer, which I think is very prophetic. He said, I always skated to where the puck was going to be, not where it was. And that's what we have to look at from a security point of view. We have to be anticipating these issues because technology is moving too fast. You can't look at what's there today and solve that problem because it takes five years for the policy to catch up with it. And then by then, the technology has already moved way beyond. So this becomes a very important point of you have to look at being forward thinking about where things are going to be and developing solutions that are technology and hardware independent. So that regardless, whether you're into quantum computing or you know, zero client technology, you know, the VDI environment or whatever it is, you still got a QWERTY keyboard, you still have a desktop, and you still have to secure that endpoint. Whether the encryption is out at the endpoint or back in a comm closet some, somewhere, 
All the architectures, all the topologies are common when you look at it from the outside in, from the end point. Now, the IPS container then gives you several ad ad advantages. First of all, it is a self-contained CAA. Use it anywhere. And you can move it. It's also closed door, unattended operating environment. So the network equipment stays on and running and secured 24 seven. You need to have it built to be flexible in terms of sizes and shapes so that you can adapt to different operating environments. You also have to have a legacy backward compatibility to existing architectures that are out there, whether it's within a SCIF or whether it's using PDS, you have to adapt to that. And also, as you go up the scale, you need to look at putting it into higher level office environments as well as in uh, normal uh, enterprise work, workspace. And the last thing is that the physical security side also involves a Tempest component from an emissions point of view. If the equipment is kept inside the safe all the time and running inside the safe, there also needs to be an option when you get up to the TSSCI levels to be able to provide Tempest pro protection. And now there's been a threat that's been there all along, but it's emerging as now being an important threat vector to us. And that's against a hemp attack, an EMP attack. And that is where China, Russia, Iran, North, North Korea are. That's where they're putting their money because it's a very cheap way of wiping out our in infrastructure. You get the grid, you get our networks down. We're totally dependent on them. And as all these networks expand more and more, we become more and more dependent. So having a solution that can provide EMP hardening is now becoming much more important. This is just uh, some pictures here of examples, different sizes and shapes of safes that you can use in very different op operating environments. You can also adapt it to existing PDS because you can actually take the patch panel from inside the safe, put a switch in the safe to keep it out of the user's hands, but then people can plug into it just as they have been in, in the past. It's somewhat of a Band-Aid because it doesn't give you a lot of the security that you would like to have, but it does give you the at least uh, continuing operating authority until the architecture can be updated. You can also put it in furniture. Uh, this has been a, uh, a very in interesting market because, uh, well, let's put it this way. Generals are probably the most challenging, worst case operating environment you can find because they want all the convenience in the world. They want all the, the accessibility. They don't want to have to worry about security all that much and they want to have it look good. So you have to kind of adapt to that market and, and this is a a very successful way that that has been accomplished. And this is what a, a uh, IPS container with a Tempest or an EMP hardened enclosure would look like. You can either do the hardened enclosure by itself as a standalone, or again, as we talk about the holistic effect of integrating various levels of security, you can add physical security and Tempest security together in one box. But, so, now, just to review here quick, um, you have a self-contained unit versus a fixed facility. You have something that's protecting equipment. You don't care about the people, you don't care about the room, you don't care about where it is, you're focused on the network equipment, the crown jewels. And that's what you have to protect, not just the space that you're operating in. There's a cost component which by the way makes it movable, it's a non-obsolescent sol solution, and it's transportable as well. So now you have modular construction instead of lengthy build cycles and a permanence that you're stuck with. You now have something that is truly married to the network, not the building. And with that, you now are attached via encryption to the network you're not physically attached by PDS or by having a Dropbox or something that confines where you can access the network. 
That's becoming an increasing prob problem as things change. And the manpower issue. With PDS, which is now supposed to be inspected every four to eight hours, it's just not being done anymore. They don't have the manpower for it. And so that becomes a real al albatross around the network operational environment. And with having a self-contained, running 24-7, network-centric IPS container, you have a solution where you can actually uh, turn it on, let it run, and not worry about it. And so now we have one other area that we have to talk about. And that is the user itself. Again, security is always a people problem. And you have to deal with that man-machine, that user interface. And the way to do it is because SCIFs have the users inside, that's one advantage. You at least have them confined. Whereas when you have the equipment secured and the user is outside of the safe, you have to deal with that. And that becomes a method of where you need effective access controls. And now you're looking at the access to, to the network. If we go back and look at a SCIF, they always have what they call an IDS, an intrusion detection sy system. And that could be motion sensors or whatever you may have. But it's separate from the network. And it's what alerts guards that someone is where they shouldn't be and that they can then respond. The problem is the response is manpower intensive. It's slow. They're allowed 10 to 15 minutes to respond. You can do a lot of damage in that time. And the, uh, the fact that the IDS is only giving you an indication that something is wrong. It doesn't tell you what's wrong or what the threat is or what you need to do as a countermeasure except send in the cavalry. And so you need to have something that's better defined than that. So when you look at the safe by itself, as the physical security people have for 30, 40 years, my gosh, the, I, the, I, the storage container, the GSA container, was invented in 1955. And it was really at the direction of Dwight David Eisenhower at the time, who said we have to have physical security because a couple of technologies had come out at the time. Xerox, xerography, you could copy stuff. It wasn't carbon paper securing, you know, where you had three or four copies and that's all that existed of a classified do document. You now could copy it. So there needed to be physical. That's how the technology really started when you look at the information era of getting away from uh, paper, getting to electronics. All these transitions have been taking place over the last 30, 40, 50 years, and the physical security world just hasn't responded very well to it. So as a physical security platform, the safe by itself doesn't solve the problem. It is basically the foundation of an integrated solution that actually covers from the user all the way to the cloud and has proactive access controls, what I actually call PACs, that can allow you to effectively control the endpoint, integrating physical, cyber, OPSEC, all the other SECs together to make it a holistic sol solution. It involves two things. It involves, first of all, the user interface to the network. And secondly, it involves the securing of the network interface itself, the network equipment. And we're going to talk about a couple of, of, of alternatives to how that happens. And with that, and if you can control the user interface to the network and the network equipment at the endpoint, and it's all encrypted within this, this safe, you don't have to worry about the human ele element. It's minimized. And you don't have to worry about exposing net network e equipment. So how do we do that? One solution is with a supplemental two-factor authentication at the desktop that only turns on and off the keyboard monitor and mouse or VTC terminal or voice over IP phone or whatever you have. So it is a physical on-off gateway that now allows you to enter in your SIPR token and get online. The value of that is 
It's locally managed. And with that in mind, it now gives you the ability of controlling the user interface to give them full immediate access to the network, but they don't get exposed to network equipment. So you meet the C CCRI re requirements, but also from a functional point of view, it's very convenient, it's very fast, and it's very effective. Uh, go back to the Geico ad, you know, so simple even a caveman can do it, right? Whether that's a general or a private, right, or whatever, or an airman. But the, the real key is that you want to be able to control the desktop physically and proactively. So that's before they can even get online. So an Edward Snowden would not have had access to the network equipment to be able to put in his little scan disk or whatever he pulled everything off on because there wouldn't be a hardware interface there for him. It would be monitored and controlled. Now, a couple things, human things. One of the things that came up, just as an example of how you have to adapt to the human element here, and that is a lot of times you could have a, a KVM switch that would have nipper and sipper on it, and you could toggle between the two. So we've had customers, in fact, it was a guy at Camp Lejeune who came up with this idea, said, Bob, listen, we got a problem here. Because generals are smart guys, but sometimes they're lazy and they don't like to do this. So we want to have a means of detecting whether the human is there in front of that interface or not. Because if they have a KVM switch, they can just put it on nipper mode and stand up and walk out and then come back and just put it back on sipper, which would not comply with anything but it would be convenient. So what was added is a motion sensor to detect that that human has to be there because their zone of responsibility is a 15 foot diameter around that workstation when they're there. They stand up and walk away, it's they're accountable for it at any level. And so these are the kinds of things that you can add in to make it convenient but accountable. Now. The other thing is that the network devices now are on and running 24-7 inside the safe. So you have your crypto, you have your switch, your router, you have a laptop or a thin client or whatever you have inside, whether it's one, two, three, five users, whether you're connecting VTC terminals or, or whatever, that's all on and running, which means all the patches are always up to date because the SIPR circuit is on 24-7. So it's very stable from a DISA point of view. And it complies with all the patch management re requirements to maintain the current patches. That's aut automatic. Plus, the user now has instant SIPR access to the network because the laptop or whatever's in, inside, the, the processing device is always on. So it gives you instant on, instant off, but it's also totally secured. The other thing is that you need to do it in a way that allows an air gapping so that there is a physical disconnect between the red signals and what's exposed to, to the desktop. Because once you get out to the desktop, those signals are red. And that's why the user has to be there because they're accountable. If they're not there, it's got to go dark and it's got to be air gapped so that the zipper laptop or whatever it is in the safe is physically separated from outside of the safe. And those are operational and physical kinds of requirements that need to be blended into the network environment to make it work. Now you're able to give the user access to the network and they don't have to get into the safe. Yes, sir? If you want to see one, I have one on display down in booth 307 downstairs, so you can show it there. Uh, the, the point of securing the network equipment now is that users don't even need the combination to the safe anymore. They don't have to go in to pull out crypto keys or to pull out hard drives or to pull out lap, laptops. You can eliminate that threat vector by just, they don't even need to know the combo. It's on a need to know basis. The only guy who knows it is the network tech or the custodian for that area. That's it. Now, uh, 
This works fine at the desktop. We now have to look at the network equipment. Here's an example of one where you have a desktop access control, two-factor authentication. You can use any two factors you wish, uh, CAC pin, fingerprint pin, whatever. And you have a gateway that just physically turns things on and off. Very simple, very effective. One domain, one user only. We don't get into multi-domain environments. And because of that, this makes it a workable sol solution. The second half of this equation has to do with protecting the network equipment. It's the last thing we're going to talk about here. Very quickly, when you have equipment working in a computer cabinet, they have things called PDUs, protective distribution units, that have the ability of monitoring temperature and humidity and power to control the devices should they overheat for whatever reason. And one solution that has been advanced is to expand the capability of these IP addressable units because they're just like an IDS. They're an IP addressable web-based solution that can go to a NOC or a guard station or whoever is monitoring the security and they can actually uh, continuously monitor that equipment inside the safe. The key to it is this. You want to keep it separate from network traffic. So it doesn't have to be JITIC approved or on an APL list. It is just like an IDS system. However, the problem with an IDS system is it only gives you an indication of a problem. It doesn't diagnose it. It doesn't give you any countermeasure. And so now what has been done is we've been able to monitor the lock and the door of the safe. Again, we're not worried about people in the room anymore. We're worried about network equipment. So we don't care who's opening that safe. We just know that as soon as they turn that spin dial, it doesn't have to be the user anymore. It's either the network tech who's authorized or a threat, a bad guy, an insider threat. Or it could be one of the same, both of them. And so if you can monitor the lock rotation monitor whether the lock is locked or unlocked, and monitor the door just as a skiff does, that all works out. Now, here's the issue. When you monitor these, you have to be careful that the user who is looking at this, this operating environment could try to cir circumvent this. And so if they know the combo, can they get in? Well, the key here is this. Once you send these alerts out, which are done on like S, S and MP traps, the problem with an, an IDS system is it gives you an alarm. It's like a warning light on your car, engine warning light. It could be anything from the indicator light being bad from an ECV valve, or it could be your engine about to blow up. You don't know. You just know there's a problem. So here's what this solves, is you want to have the ability of sending out a command, because they take the signals in to alert, they can send out a command to power everything off. And that solves the problem, because now you can actually control that network ac access that if someone is breaking in, they can power everything out, zeroize the crypto, turn off the switch router. Once they get in, they can do it in the time that it takes. So. That's what it looks like. I think we're running out of time here, but here's what we have. The ability to meet C CCRIs, the ability to secure network equipment, not just the room, and that it's online, not offline. The fact that your, sec your security is tied to the network, not the facility, and the user access is there. So the key is that you should look at against insider threats using an IPS container as a solution with the access controls for the user and for the net network equipment in conjunction with what you're doing with cybersecurity to give you that effective endpoint security. Any, any questions? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Yes. Hmm? Oh, just give, give, give me your card.
It can't. Okay. It's not by motion. It's by heat. Got you. Because I know when I, was, when I was a comms tech account manager, I, I worked at Volt as a life for motion sensor operator, and so was the IDS. And right. I'd be sitting there you know, doing my stuff, and all of a sudden everything would turn off, and the IDS would start blinking. I have to run over to the There we go. Thank you. Huh? Just fine. Just a little long, that's all, but we trimmed it down. So everybody's in line, I get to, just to get their certification. But yep, here we go. We're great. Thank you.